Here we go. We are back here on the Lynn Hayes Freeland Show. Brian Brim is my guest. His book is Punch Me Up to the Gods. What does that mean? Uh, you wouldn't be amazed by how many times I'm asked this question. It is kind of a uh, rewording of something that my father used to say. Um, his uh, perception or his idea of manhood was one wherein if you didn't perform manhood correctly, like you should be sent back to God. You should be, um, you know, sent back to God to be remade. It's kind of his version of, you know, I brought you into this world. I'll take you out, you know, which, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. some parents say. Um, but his sort of uh, form of communication, because he was not able to process um, a lot of emotions, was punches. Um, mm -hmm. And so we came up with this title, Punch Me Up to the Gods. Um, and that's basically what that means. Like so many people have asked me what that means. Uh, I think it uh, is uh, a phrase that, you know, it's, it's a sort of amalgam of the kind of threats he used to uh, uh, produce. And see, that's interesting because when I saw the name of the book, and you told me uh, back, I want to say when I had you on the radio show, I think you told me the title of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I was then going through the book, as I look at all of the things you grapple with throughout this book, for me, Punch Me Up to the Gods was that point where you had reached a place in your life where you could soar. Yeah, I think that, you know, the great thing about the title is that, you know, when people guess what it means after reading the book, I love hearing people you know, kind of come up with their own interpretation of what it means. Uh, to some people, it's a defiant, you know, uh, dare, you know, I dare you to try to punch me up to the gods. For some mm -hmm. people, uh, it's it's something simpler. So, you know, I think that once you have closed the last page of the book and you're processing it, um, the title means different things to different people. Absolutely. And I guess that's, I mean, that's probably the goal of, of a good writer. So... Yeah, you're trying to keep people interested. <laughs> well, you don't have, there. there's no shortage of that. Uh, because you also, I mean, in, in going through your life, I mean, you also deal with some stuff that a lot of times we as a society, we as a community, aren't necessarily comfortable talking about. We're not comfortable talking about race. We're not talking about, we're not comfortable talking about skin color. We're not comfortable talking about sexuality. Right. And you got all that in this book. I got all of that in here. And, you know, let's talk about it. You know, these are my experiences with race, you know, sexuality, gender, you know, gender roles, like that whole thing. But we definitely don't, you know, as a society, want to talk about the race card, mm -hmm. you know, if you can call it that. You know, we don't want to talk about race in general. Um, you know, I just read where Texas has now passed a bill where you can't, Talk about race in uh, in high schools. Oh, which, right. Yeah. yeah. Which is unfortunate because, you know, the thing that racism thrives on, the, the bedrock of racism is ignorance. Um, and so now they've just passed a whole law in support of ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, no, we don't want to talk about this country's history with race. We don't want to talk about, you know, uh, sticky issues when it comes to uh, sexuality and gender. These are conversations that we we would like to avoid, but you know, it's weird how they keep cropping up. You know, it's weird how the people who let who are on the outside of what is considered normal want to have these conversations, and the people who fall into what is considered normal or proper or um, accepted, they don't want to have these conversations. So it's a it's a tug of war that's not going to end anytime soon. It's not going to end anytime soon. Um, and it is amazing how early it starts. I mean, when it, it begins, I mean, you talk about experiences as, I don't know if you said an age or if I just don't recall an age, uh, but a, a time early in your life where kids in the neighborhood, kids in the area thought you acted like a white kid. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was, that was one of the, <laughs> was one of the taunts that I got. It was like either white kid or they would use derogatory names for, you know, a person, they would call me all kinds of names. And, and, you know, the, the equation that was being made was that because I was bookish and I wasn't interested in sports and because I wasn't 
masculine, quote, quote unquote, masculine, mm-hmm. you know, that equated to being a white boy because, um, you know, white boys were in my neighborhood, in my very black neighborhood in Ohio, were considered to be less masculine, you know. So I was accused of being, you know, a white boy because, you know, I like to read and I like to write, or I was called, you know, uh, the F word because I like to read or like to write. It was all this sort of, uh, all saying the same thing, you know, the things that you are doing um, do not make you a black man. You know, being a black man is being uh, cool, which, you know, translated it into, you know, not having any feelings, um, not having, definitely not displaying the softer emotions like you know, mm-hmm. uh, depression or hurt or crying or anything like that. And I think that's a shame because I think it deprives these rules that we have around um, manhood and black masculinity um, deprive men of a full life. You know, you're not just a man. You're not just a black man. You're a human being. I think human beings are entitled to have the full range, the full spectrum of human experience. And then I'm curious, when did you begin to assess what that was that was hap- that was swirling around you and how it affected you? When did you figure that out? Well, after I sobered up, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I spent a long time of my life, too long, um, just, uh, you know, a 30 year blackout on, you know, drugs and alcohol. And once mm-hmm. I sobered out, once I went to rehab, you know, which is where this book started, uh, once I went to rehab, I started thinking about the, um, the reasons why I, I, I went to rehab, you know, there were a lot of them. And one of them was because I just desperately hated myself because I wasn't, uh, able to live up to these ideas that society had already put in place for me. I think a lot of people get, um, you know, pigeonholed because of the body that they're born into. You can't do this, you can't do that. And there were so many rules around being um, male and black um, that I just couldn't live up to um, that I wound up really hating myself for a lot of reasons. And that's mm-hmm. when I went to rehab, I sobered up, um, I got some therapy. <laughs> Um, and I really started to assess, you know, uh, the world around me as opposed to punishing myself, uh, for not being what the world wanted me to be. I started to question the world and, um, that's, you know, one of the other origins of this book. And, you know, we got to take another, an, another commercial break. Cause here's the other thing that struck me about the book. Uh, and I'm sure this was not like a book for parents or parenting, but there's so many things that resonate in here, I think, for parents, because everybody has, or most parents have this vision or this dream or this goal or whatever it is they think their child should be. And sometimes they lose sight of who their child is yeah. and don't understand the implications of yeah. that. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, I, my mother just read the book. Um, you know, she told me, she swore up and down she wasn't going to read it. When I, when I was I just going to say, I thought she said she wasn't going to read the book. Okay. She swore up and down she wasn't going to read it. I sent her one anyway, and I said, you know, uh, just maybe put it up on the shelf and tell people mm-hmm. your son wrote a book. But she yeah. actually read it, um, and she said that she felt bad. Uh, and, I, you know, that certainly wasn't the purpose of the book. You know, mm-hmm. she did the best that she could, but, you know, uh, what do you do when your kid, I don't have any kids, you know, what do you do when your kid turns out to be absolutely nothing like you hope they would be, you know? Um, and I guess the answer to that is you just do the best you can. Some parents, and I'm lucky, you know, some parents completely cut their children off totally when right. they not what they, what their parent expects them to be. But it's a good question, you know, yeah. and it's one that I'm glad I don't have to grapple with because I don't have any kids. <laughs> Take a commercial break. We have a lot more to talk about, as, as including where you can get the book. So stick around. 